welcome to the World Duchenne Awareness Day 2022 official online event, Women and Duchenne. This event is intended for anyone who's interested in creating a better future for people living with Duchenne or Becker, Becker muscular dystrophy. I'm now here joined by Elizabeth Vroom, the chair of the World Duchenne Organization, and Nicoletta Madia, who is the community coordinator for World Duchenne Organization. Nicoletta, we are in a beautiful palace. Where are we today? Hello everyone, we are in Rome, actually in the center of Rome, close to Piazza di Spagna, in a really beautiful and historical palace, Palazzo Torlonia. And we are honored to be here as a guest for this online important event. All right, let's move forward and find out where this is going to take place. Now Elizabeth, why are we in this beautiful palace here today? Well, we are here because we have World Duchenne Awareness Day 2022. And why we need this World Duchenne Awareness Day? Because everybody around the globe, clinicians, families, doctors, uh, researchers, industry, and, and also policy makers should know what is Duchenne, what are the needs, and why it's so important to listen to us. And every year we have a special theme, this year Women and Duchenne, and we will record the online program for this day now. And also an important tradition at World Duchenne Awareness Day is what we call the Duchenne promo video, a short clip that we hope you will make us help to go viral across the globe today. And to kick off this event today, we're gonna launch our promo video of 2022 right now. So this is the official World Duchenne Awareness Day promo video. Make sure you share it as much as you can today. And with that, we have arrived in our official talk show setting where we spent the entire show talking about this topic of women and Duchenne. Well, let's lighten up that topic a little bit. Elizabeth, I thought Duchenne is a disease only in boys and men. Why do we talk about the women today? Well, first of all, that's a misunderstanding. I mean, there are more boys who are severely uh, uh, affected by this disease, but there are also women, they are carriers. They're, it's a more heterogeneous group, but they are there and they need care as well. So that is an important aspect. And of course, there are others as well. I mean, there are women around the man with Duchenne, there are female scientists. But I think if you say it's only men, that is kind of a misunderstanding, and we hope to do something today to explain that. Why? Exactly. An important theme to dive deeper in it, to understand more about it, to learn and to, to take better care of, of people in general uh, with and around Duchenne. Nicoletta, what does this team, Women and Duchenne, mean for you? This team means actually to provide voice to our women because they really deserve it. So we have really powerful women around our community, uh, mothers, sisters, um, and clinicians involved, everyone who is part of, the, of our families and our world. They really deserve a voice. They deserve a voice, and that's why our program today also has this threefold structure. We start in the first part talking about women and Duchenne. We look at the rare uh, children with Duchenne, at mothers and carriers or not, those are all included. In the second part, we learn more about women surrounding Duchenne, and there we dive deeper into mothers and what's important for them, but also into siblings and girlfriends and spouses, everybody around people with Duchenne. And in the third part, we celebrate important women in the community of Duchenne worldwide, and actually those are also spread out through the program as well. Now, we have a, a full two hours ahead of us, uh, Elizabeth. What do you hope our participants today take away from this? Well, first of all, in line with what we just said, we hope that there's more awareness that there are girls and women 
uh, with um, Duchenne muscular dystrophy and in fact also with Becker muscular dystrophy as well. So they are earlier diagnosed, they get better care, people recognize it and also they get the respect they deserve. We hear for example from carriers, adult carriers, that as a child they always heard they were lazy. They, they really were punished for being lazy while they couldn't do any better. So I think that the, this awareness, if we do that, that's already one, fantastic. Yeah. Then in the care, uh, what, which part of the care the boys get are also applicable to the women and where do we need extra guidelines for the women to, to take better care of them. They, so, they might have very specific needs. Yes, and they also they ask for gender-specific information. So how do we start to provide that? And there is a lot of information, but it's not kind of collected and presented in a way people can work with it. So I think to collect the knowledge, to use the knowledge already there to serve the community better, that would be fantastic. And then I think the women around Duchenne, that is, uh, uh, you know, that's really a, a part we will discuss more, I think, today, because that's a subject. The mothers, the spouses, they all do their job better than a human being almost could do sometimes, you know, mm -hmm. it's amazing. But also, how can we help them? How can we better support them? Because that's super important uh, as well. I mean, as Michelle Obama once said, you know, you, only first, you can only look after somebody else if you first look well after uh, yourself. So that's important. And then, of course, with the fantastic women, uh, the scientists, the clinicians we have in our community, we really hope that we also will inspire the next generation of clinicians and, and, and uh, scientists who want to help with this because we need them so badly. Wow, that's an important and powerful uh, mission, uh, Elizabeth. Awareness, better care, empowerment and celebration and, and growth of the community. Uh, Nicoletta, what is your hope for this show today? Yeah, I really hope that people can uh, actually understand the importance of networks too, because uh, we will see uh, a lot of experiences where groups, networks, community working together really make a difference. And the other important point that I really would love to, uh, you know, to address during the event is the importance of education. Because one mother, for example, that is super educated about the management of the disease um, is one mother that can really you know, provide the better quality of life for her son. So education, network, together with empowerment and all the topics addressed by Elizabeth are extremely important. Well, we'll see both of you more throughout this program, either aside one of our guests and definitely at the end. I'll come back to you and, and we look back, we reflect and uh, wrap up. Now it's about time to start. Soon I will talk to two professors in genetics to better understand uh, Duchenne and, and muscular dystrophy in general in women. But first, we're going to hear a story from a girl living with uh, Duchenne. We're going to take you to Spain where uh, Maria Bernabeu was interviewed by you, Nicoletta, and shares what it's like for her daughter, Alma, to live with Duchenne. Soy Maria, eh, Maria Bernabeu, y soy la mamá de, de Alma Navarro. Ella tiene ahora ocho años y es una de las niñas que, afectadas por la distrofia muscular de Duchenne. Alma, cuando nació, no, no era aparente ningún problema, pero sí que es cierto que conforme iban pasando los meses, eh, Alma no se sentaba, no tenía fuerza ninguna en las piernas ni en los brazos, Entonces fue cuando empezamos a sospechar que, que pasaba algo con ella. Al llevarla fue a los 18 meses, cuando tenía 18 meses la llevamos por primera vez al neuropediatra y ahí fue donde empezó el recorrido para, para ver qué tenía nuestra, nuestra hija. El diagnóstico en papel nos lo dieron cuando ella cumplió los tres años de edad y fue impactante, aunque ya más o menos podíamos sospechar qué era lo que tenía Alma, 
es cierto que todo el mundo nos decía que no era posible y de hecho el, en lo que encontrabas escrito hasta ese momento que una niña padeciera la distrofia muscular de Duchenne no, no era algo posible, pero así fue. Vale, en todo este proceso, mientras nos daban el diagnóstico de alma, yo buscaba, buscaba mucho porque necesitaba, necesitaba saber, necesitaba entender qué le pasaba a mi hija. Entonces, en toda esa búsqueda, una de las cosas que, que te salía enseguida era la asociación de Duchenne para en Project España. Yo me puse en contacto con ellos, aún sin tener el diagnóstico de alma en firme. Me, vamos, me dieron bastante luz. Alma quizá fuera la primera niña que diagnosticaron en España, pero en ese recorrido, en Francia, en Holanda, México, Nicaragua, en India, o sea, hay, hay muchas más niñas, muchas más niñas. Es una minoría y es como pasa siempre. Están, yo considero que están bastante abandonadas. A nivel de ensayos clínicos, este, estos años atrás, aquí en España han habido varios ensayos clínicos que niños de la asociación han tenido la oportunidad de, de entrar en ellos. Mi hija no, no tiene esa oportunidad. Desde el minuto uno es varones. Mi hija no es varón, por lo tanto no, no le dan la oportunidad de probar algo en ella que, vamos a ver, quizá funcione. No sabemos qué va, a ser, qué va a ser de ellas, porque no hay, no hay nada para darles y tampoco nada para probar en ellas, de momento. El vivir con un diagnóstico de, de Duchenne es, es vivir contra reloj, tanto en niñas como en niños. Aparte de, de ser mamá de alma, yo soy mujer, tengo trabajo, tengo tres hijos más, aparte de Alma. Tengo un marido al que también tengo que prestarle atención. Tengo muchas cosas. Y cuando empiezas con un diagnóstico así, parece que todo lo demás lo dejas a un lado para poder, de alguna manera, para intentar cambiar eso que, eso que está, que no, que no puedes cambiar. Que en realidad lo que tienes que hacer es saber Saber vivir con, con eso, aprender a que está ahí. Ser mamá de una niña con distrofia muscular de Duchenne a mí me ha hecho, me ha hecho cambiar. Creo que ser algo mejor que era, pero a, a base de tropezar y darte cuenta. Thank you, Maria, for sharing the story of Alma with us here today at World Duchenne Awareness Day. And throughout this program, we will take you around the world to share more stories with you, so stay tuned. Right now, we zoom in on the scientific perspectives to better understand uh, women with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And therefore, I'm now joined by two very important women in the community, uh, Professor in Genetics, Alessandra Ferlini, from the University of Ferrara here in Italy. Welcome. Thank you very much, Jared. And also Annemika Arsmarus, your professor in genetics at the Leiden University Medical Center and also one of the co-founders of the Dutch Center for RNA Therapeutics. With you, we'd like to see if we can better understand. We always thought Duchenne is a typically disease for boys and men, but Alessandra, why can women also be affected? Yeah, thank you, Jared. So, uh, Female carriers can be affected with dystrophy nopetis, uh, uh, different, you know, uh, severity, of course. Uh, I have to say first that this is an extremely rare event. Even more rare. Yeah. yeah, even more rare, right? Because we are talking about rare diseases, but these cases are extremely rare. Uh, in, some, uh, in some cases, we know why, because there are some particular genetic configuration, genetic uh, conditions, which are causing the fact that females are symptomatic, so they manifest symptoms, because generally female carriers are fully normal. 
Mm -hmm. A situation might be uh, a chromosomal abnormalities which are underlining some specific phenotypes, as in this case for X-linked uh, -link disorders, or, uh, you know, situation in which only one X chromosome is present in females. And the, the very interesting fact, uh, which has an evolutionary importance, because X chromosomes and also Y chromosomes are important in the evolution, is that females have two chromosomes, but only one is active, is full on. Mm -hmm. And the other one it was silenced throughout the evolution because to keep, in order to keep the balance somehow between females and males mm -hmm. who have only one chromosome. So this is a very particular mechanism which many, in many, in sometimes, uh, as I said very rarely, can also be linked to the fact that females can have symptoms. For example, the two chromosomes, one is on, one is off, are not fully balanced, 50-50. Females are mosaics. Mm -hmm. You know, the famous cats uh, with the, you know, all the, uh, you know, different colors yeah. are always females. So in that case, we are very similar. We are mosaics. We need both chromosomes, but only one is active for each cell. Mm -hmm. And that may cause some, in sometimes, unbalancing of the two copies. And, of course, this might also be related to getting some uh, Duchenne muscle dystrophy symptoms. But still, we need to know and to study more to get insight into this very rare uh, disease condition for females. So if I understand, in most cases we do not see symptoms because of the two X chromosomes, but in some very rare cases there still might be an effect and that then results in a range of carriers with no symptoms at all, perhaps mild symptoms and, and more severe Exactly. Symptoms. So there is a sort of, uh, you know, a spectrum of symptoms from severe cases, unfortunately, from very mild and to nothing, which is the majority of female carriers. And uh, the, the role of these two X chromosomes and how they are switched on off in muscle cells, but not only muscle, we know now, it's so important that we really would like to know better how the switching is regulated and can vary depending on the cell type. Yeah, and that's what I also hear you say, this is a field which is not fully known yet. There's yeah. a, still a lot of uncertainties. Absolutely, yes. And, and research work to Yeah, be because of the rarity, of course, of this, uh, these cases, but uh, of course, nevertheless, they are so important also to understand that the mechanisms of muscle dystrophy also in males, for example, therapeutic perspectives, uh, Annemiek will probably tell us something more, so studying rare cases, we should know that is helping a lot in understanding mechanisms that can be applied to many, many patients. Exactly, so to that's the, the message. Population. Yeah, very important work. Anamika, before we dive into that a little further, as I said in my opening, we're also celebrating important women in the uh, Duchenne community. You are also named one of the world's leading researchers in Duchenne. You call yourself the mouse doctor because you do a lot of experience <laughs> with, with mouse. Before we get to, into the scientific content, can you help us understand and maybe inspire some fellow researchers? What drives you to devote so much of your time and effort to the field of Duchenne? So how I ended up in the field of Duchenne was, was by accident, actually, because um, I liked genetics and I found that really interesting. Um, and then I was looking for, well, a, a PhD position and there was one in, in Duchenne muscular dystrophy and well, the gene was attractive because it's very big, complicated, um, the mechanism in which it works, how it can cause Duchenne, how it can also cause Becker, how it can sometimes cause Duchenne in, in females. That was all very interesting. So I started from a say, genetic interest. Um, but then, well, the longer I worked in it, I also met the families, the, the, the patients, but also very importantly, the mothers who are also a driving force in the, in the, in the patient community. Um, and I think so I started with the genetic interest and I stayed because of the, the Duchenne family, so to say. Beautiful. Well, we're, we're very happy that you're here. You are also uh, doing a lot yourself to raise awareness. You, uh, you are on Twitter where you do <laughs> a paper a day. I hear Alessandro say the, the, the women with the Duchenne dystrophy are actually very important in better understanding 
the uh, disease in general. I believe there's an important paper about that as well. Yeah. So actually, the, the back when the gene was not known, um, the, the techniques that we had as geneticists were, were, were very limited. So while we now say most men with Duchenne have huge deletions, back then we couldn't see where the deletions were in the chromosomes. But the, 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 the females with Duchenne that Alessandro was just uh, uh, hinting at, um, if they have translocation, so one cr part of one chromosome is mixed with the X chromosome, and that goes through the dystrophin gene, then these women will have full-blown Duchenne. And actually, these mutations were crucial in finding where the gene was on the X chromosome, and then we could zoom in more and more and more. So that resulted eventually in identifying the gene. So it's interesting that the disease that occurs primarily in boys Finding the genes needed these very rare women that, that also had to share. They were an important part of the puzzle. They were a crucial part, yeah. Back to uh, Maria, who uh, talked to us about Alma. We hear her say in a sentence that her daughter is excluded from clinical trials. Why mm. is that? Um, so I think f in, in some cases it's justified. Um, because either due to the very rare mutation type, mutation-specific therapies will not work, um, but also sometimes because muta uh, mutation-specific therapies can make things worse for women with Duchenne. Mm. Um, and if, if you look, take as an example exon skipping, so exon skipping tries to restore the genetic code for men with Duchenne. But women have two X chromosomes. So they have one that produces dystrophin and one that doesn't produce dystrophin. And apparently the one that doesn't produce dystrophin is more active but the one that does produce dystrophin is still there, producing mm -hmm. dystrophin at low amounts. Now, if we do exon skipping, the one that doesn't produce dystrophin will start producing dystrophin. However, the one that does produce dystrophin will stop producing dystrophin. And that one was producing the normal dystrophin. So in that case, it can make things worse because you're not only restoring something, you're also breaking something. However, so this is mainly due to the effect of the two, the two X chromosomes yeah. that we lear just learned from yeah. Alessandra yeah. about. But if the, um, the women, if the therapies just target the pathology, so the, the inflammation, the formation of fibrosis, the limited uh, muscle repair, all those aspects also happen in women with Duchenne. Mm -hmm. So these therapeutic approaches should also be tested in Duchenne because there's no reason why they shouldn't also work there. So I, I, I agree with Alma that for those also uh, women should be eligible. Exactly. So it originates from a precaution, specifically yeah. in, in exoskipping type of therapies. And you say in other in in trials, others, yeah. women should be included. Yeah, actually. but then it... Because I can imagine from a scientific perspective, yeah. it makes things more complex. Eh? It because does make more things variables. more complex, but then there's also... So you can maybe say, okay, so then they're not in the trial, but they're in a spe special program a in a subgroup. Because the problem is, if you test something only in males, then the regulators may also say, then we're also only going to approve, approve it for males. Uh -huh. So it's, I think it's good to have a special subgroup where you say, okay, let's also test this in females, but only when you say there is a rationale why this should work in females. And if there are mutation-specific approaches where you say, well, but actually this might make, make it worse, obviously you're not going to put the women it's in It's an important call to action. I hope uh, those watching uh, forward this message uh, to their scientists in, the, in their countries and in their networks as well. So what can you share with us about drug development and development specifically for women with Duchenne? Um, so we are not focusing specifically on Duchenne. What's interesting is that because the, the mouse model for Duchenne is less severely affected, um, we breed them so that we both have males and females, mouse with, 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 without dystrophin. Um, so we study the, 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 the female mice there. And what we see is often that lacking dystrophin, usually the female mice functionally do better than the male mice. So there is something interesting happening there. And like Alessandra said, there's a lot we don't know yet. So that is something that, that we can study more. Um, and of course, well, if we study uh, muscle pathology, if we target muscle pathology, we try to treat both males and females. Also because if you target pathology, there's other diseases, other muscular diseases that happen in both men and women where you want to target where this. You can learn and from. so, yeah, you can learn from that. So, I think we, we try to include both uh, male and female mice. And what's interesting is that one of the questions we used to have was how much dystrophin do you need? Mm -hmm. And, well, like Alessandra said, women 
they inactivate randomly one of their axes. So they will, if they're a carrier, they will have 50% dystrophin. Um, and we know that usually 50% is enough. So we it's enough to be asymptomatic. To be asymptomatic. Exactly. So we used to trick because you can, in mice, you can play with this, this um, inactivation. So we used to trick where the healthy um, X chromosome was preferentially inactivated. So now we had mice that had randomly anywhere between three and 20% dystrophin. And that allowed us to see, so okay, at which time point, at which amount of dystrophin do these mice get better? And what we saw was we always thought, well, you need at least 20%. Even less than 4%, the mice will survive longer. And less than 4%, functionally, they will do better. If they have more than 4%, they do even better. If they have more than 15%, they're similar to wild-type mice. Now, this is mouse, this is not mm -hmm. human, um, but it did teach us that, well, we, you don't need to go for the 50% or the 20%. Less is probably also already slowing down disease progression. And this is an important starting point for therapy development, yes. because yeah. what are you aiming yeah. for, right? And I think also, so when we produced this data, I think it helped also the regulators to approve drugs because they knew, well, it, it makes sense that little bits also can, can have therapeutic effects. Wow, important findings. Thank you so much for the work. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm fantasizing that people are sharing <laughs> these videos also to academics around the world. If, if you have this stage here today on World Duchenne Awareness Day, what would you like to uh, call your uh, researchers for? I think, well, they should, they should focus on, make, well, they should collaborate. I think that's the first and most first important thing. First message we hear. Collaborate, um, and they should share their results, both positive and negative. Um, and I think both Alessandro and I, sometimes we have an hypothesis and it turns out not to be true. Mm -hmm. um, we publish that exactly. because then the field knows no one else has to duplicate it and people can continue. Okay, if this doesn't work, maybe that works. So I think that's another message. Publish all your findings. If your hypothesis was correct, if your hypothesis was not correct, it's equally important. So collaborate, share, share data. Um, I think that is the, the, the most important yeah, thing. And make sure you have women either exactly. included be, be or inclusive. as a subgroup yeah. as well. Yeah. Now, Alessandra, you do a lot of work with fellow researchers. You collaborate, for example, in the ENMC workshop uh, in the last two years. I would love to hear more about those findings. But first, I would like to share another story with you about a woman, a young adolescent woman living with Duchenne. It's Lisanne Schurs from the Netherlands. She's an author. She studied digital television, and she's here to share her story with us. <laughs> I am a woman living with Duchenne. Um, um, yeah, I am an author as well. Um, I've studied um, in England for six years um, and I did media at, in college and then I studied digital television production in, at university. There is almost no um, recognition for women living with Duchenne. So whenever you get like um, a list or like a questionnaire, it's always gonna be directed at men and boys living with this, but it's not fair to the girls and the women who are facing the same thing. I know how difficult it is to talk about having any kind of disability. Um, and I, I mean, I, I've been there, I've, I, I live with it every day and it's not easy um of course you have people if you have people who love you then that's great but it would also be great to talk to people who have with the same problems you know because it makes it more understanding and you can actually talk to, talk through it together and fix maybe fix it together if that's needed i think that this year for duchenne awareness day it's a really good topic because it finally tells people, shows people and tells people that everyone can be born with it. Um, and it's not just the men, it's not just the boys. And I think as a community, more information would be more help, would be helpful. Because what I always say is that no matter what, I'll always feel alone, like an outsider. Because first of all, I'm in a wheelchair, so I'm already different than normal people. 
um, but also because it's mostly men and boys, you just feel so isolated because I personally think that girls and women have different issues than boys do because obviously they have their own issues, but we've got issues too. And, and like, we've got personal and like gender specific issues that they don't have. And it would be great to have like a full or a flight or, you know, anything, any information about what to do when that happens, when the girl reaches that point. More information about that about living with Duchenne, maybe from the first few years till teenage years till adolescence, you know, like me now. Um, and I think that would open up a lot more, a lot of eyes. Thank you, Lisanne, for sharing your story here with us today. Now, Annemieke called for researchers to work together and Alessandra, you are actually doing that, for example, in the ENMC workshop in the last two years, uh, where researchers from both the United States and Europe and all over the world came together specifically focused on the theme of women and uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, women are an often neglected group, that's what we started with. How about the interest for this workshop? Could you get anyone together? Uh, yeah, that, yeah, thank you. It was really a sort of serendipity story somehow. Because, uh, um, well, first of all, EMC, so European Neuromuscle Center, is a no-profit organization in Europe, which is facilitating and also funding net, uh, workshops focused on neuromuscle disease. So all types, uh, many, many aspects. So very important. To much, much broader than just the shen. Yeah, 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 yeah. All neuromuscle diseases, as Annemika said before, so important to data sharing, to exchange ideas and so on. So fantastic initiative. And I was just, just checking all the workshop already organized by ENEMC, so more than 250. And they say, wow, there is no one on DMD carriers. I, could, I couldn't believe that. So immediately I wrote to some colleagues in UK and in Europe and say, are you aware of that? So we do not have nothing talking and discussing about females and Duchenne muscle dystrophy. So basically we primed up, we presented the application about what female carriers do have in terms of needs, mm -hmm. a sort of overall needs, so because they are neglected, so psych cardiological problems, psychological aspects, uh, of course, muscle uh, weakness, all aspects, all the world, uh, you know, surrounding the female carriers, uh, um, conditions and life experience. And then we organized this workshop, it was uh, in, uh, uh, we, we had that uh, this year for the COVID situation, we postponed the, for, for one year. And uh, well, we had a fantastic uh, networking and we, we are reporting now the, the yeah. results of the can, workshop. Can you share some of the findings, what happens when all these <laughs> researchers come together? What, what was an important takeaway? Well, many, uh, to be honest. So the first uh, was the, the, the definition of carrier. So we decided that uh, the symptomatic carriers is not a very good definition. So carriers might be carriers. So as for the other X-linked so disease related to X chromosome, but they can also have dystrophinopathy, so symptoms. Yeah. So being affected with that disease because somehow saying symptomatic may be a little bit misleading. Mm -hmm. Symptomatic how, symptomatic why. So they have a disease. And this is a very uh, first step in order to think about a cure. And as, as uh, Namika said, so finding possible therapeutic uh, approaches. This was a sort of the first step defining yeah. this What are we female. talking about? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And secondly, to see which is the you know, rainbow of troubles these females are encountering their life. We should think because of, that's what it is. Exactly. It's a rainbow of troubles. It's a rainbow of troubles yeah, doesn't sound from problem. psychological aspects because females are mothers, sisters of the Shen boy. So they uh, they have a lot of burden of the disease to carry on. Of course, there is the family which is supporting all the situation, but females are 
pillars, uh, for especially for X-link disorders because of a lot of psychological implication, uh, feel of guilty. There is a very complex psychological situation. So rainbow for troubles, including the very important cardiological aspects, mm -hmm. with, uh, with, which are disregarded now, also in the follow-up. So females, even if they are fully asymptomatic, they need, she needs a follow-up because they can develop some symptoms, especially for the cardiological problem. And then also the cognitive problems that are rare, but they are important to be recognized because they impact on quality of life so heavily. And not only the life of the carriers, but again, as I said before, the, the life of the family of the system and in, at the end of the boys. So there are, these are the three main, uh, you know, clinical awareness that we, we you know, have defined. Of course, we, we discuss about research, about yeah. you know, what we have to do, what we do not know yet. But to put in focus on these three main Those points three main is topics. important. Yeah. In, a, in a moment, we will connect with Linda Kripe, who was also in the workshop as well, Absolutely. to zoom in on the cardiac aspect of that. Does these, do these findings already lead to any recommendations or what are the next steps? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, have, uh, we are finalizing the report. It will be uh, on uh, uh, quite soon, definitely before the end of the year. And we have a list of recommendations which include uh, uh, exactly the follow-up to pay attention to females even if they, are, they have no symptoms. Mm -hmm. Of course, to define symptoms a little bit better. So, for example, discriminate clearly between signs, which is what the, the, care, the females feel, and symptoms, which are detected by medical doctor. Ah. Something that you can see objectively. And of course, this is another import, important definition. And then the guidelines also for the genetic testing, for the reproductive choice in all you know, the possibilities of females do have today in terms of prenatal testing, postnatal testing, and also pre-implantation approaches which are fully feasible today. So uh, uh, you know, a scenario of chances we can offer to these females for their life. And maybe I can add one thing because of course, if there is um, a, a, a recent patient in the family and a mother or a sister has symptoms, then it makes sense that this is a symptomatic carrier or whatever you want to call it. However, there's also women that are carriers but don't have a Duchenne patient in the family. Uh -huh. And then they have these symptoms and often that is not recognized. The clinicians will not consider that this could be a, a dystrophin mutation um, and these women then have a long diagnostic odyssey, sometimes yeah, having there's vague, yeah, fake, fake complaints, yeah. um, sometimes leading to liver biopsies and other things, and really taking a very long time before the clinician considers, well, this might be a, a symptomatic carrier. So I think that also is why it has to be more, more awareness has to be raised with the clinicians so that they also recognize these symptomatic carriers without any family history, because currently, Again, they, they are neglected and then have a long diagnostic odyssey. Again, you're underlining the importance of this topic on World Duchenne Awareness Day, so hopefully they learn. Alessandra, as a, as a final word for this stage, for the, for the global community, anything you would like to add? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, it is a privilege for working for this community um, for many reasons. I think that the Duchenne community is a you know, sort of is an example for rare diseases. It is for the story, for how uh, families and carriers uh, have been so strongly uh, involved in uh, moving the society into the, a better knowledge about the disease. So they are really a sort of pivotal, uh, um, you know, strong association, uh, encouraging, promoting research and also care for these patients. So, I think that the rare diseases as a whole are, you know, are, part, are, are a very important part of our life and that can also be very useful for medicine and for frequent disorders because they can teach us 
some important aspects. So the first one is that is vital to share. Mm -hmm. and Sharing that. collaboration. Yeah, yes. for a disease and for Duchenne, yeah. we have to be aware. So my message is please share. Please work together and share data, share ideas, share, share way of thinking, because this is the starting point of the innovation and the future that we may have. So being aware that we have to work together. Beautiful. Thank you both for your time here today you, in Rome. And uh, well, if you want to share on social media, why not add the hashtag women and Duchenne as well. If we all do that today and this month and even later, then we can also search for the hashtag and even connect more online as well. As I already mentioned, and as Alessandra mentioned, cardiac is an important topic as well. So we connected with L Professor Linda Kreip, who is a pediatric cardiologist of the uh, Heart Center and also a physician in the Nationwide Children's Hospital in Ohio. And we asked her about this specific cardiac aspect also for carriers with no symptoms. And specifically, she has some advice for also the mothers of people with Duchenne. <laughs> Linda Kreip, I'm a pediatric cardiologist at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio in the United States. I've been working in the field of Duchenne for about uh, 20 years, I would say. I'm uh, extremely passionate about uh, caring and uh, treating families with Duchenne, uh, the cardiomyopathy specifically related to the disease. I think it's really critical that um, females who carry the dystrophin gene uh, maintain uh, surveillance of their heart during the course of their lifetimes. Uh, we know from studies um, done in the past and most recently that uh, females are also um, at risk for uh, manifesting um, the same type of cardiomyopathy that the young men with Duchenne have. Um, this involves the development of uh, fibrosis or scar tissue that forms in the myocardium that eventually leads to uh, myocardial dysfunction. In some of the more recent studies that we've done um, at our institution at Nationwide Children's, we saw that about 50% of female carriers will have uh, manifestations of cardiac um, dysfunction or cardiac involvement on the MRI. So we want um, all the ladies who may be at risk to um, take good care of themselves. In addition to seeing their cardiologist and, and taking um, care of their hearts in, in that way, I think it's really critical that they take good care of themselves in other ways, in other ways um, that will reduce ultimately their cardiovascular risk factors. We know that stress plays a critical role in the development of heart disease. So trying to reduce their stress in um, as many ways as possible, which I, I agree is is really tough when you're taking care of a child with an illness, but just you know taking short time out moments, um, making sure that you're doing some things that give you joy in your life, such as exercising or spending some time reading or or walking, um, uh, just just taking a few moments um, to yourself. Um, and, and then some of the more straightforward types of things like reducing your cardiovascular risk factors, um, such as maintaining a heart healthy diet, um, trying to stay on top of your blood pressure and making sure that it's within the normal range, uh, reducing your salt intake as much as possible. Um, and then, like I mentioned before, um, getting adequate exercise. Uh, we want everybody to be um, to be as healthy as humanly possible. And I, and I do think if, if you do that, um, you're, you're going to, to um, do yourself a tremendous benefit. The Duchenne community has um, touched my life in, in a million different ways. And I really feel like I'm a part of the Duchenne community, even though I'm not directly involved with a dystrophin mutation. Um, I, I am um, continually awed by the strength and courage of of the patients as well as the families. It, it's a long road and, and I think it's going to take a village in order for us to solve this disease. So I'm, I'm really truly honored to um, be included as a warrior in the fight against Duchenne. Um, it's a really, really important fight and we all have to come together 
to uh, make that happen. And, and, and we need the moms and, and, and we need the moms to be healthy in order to, to be a good warrior. So I would encourage all, all moms out there and sisters to uh, make sure that they're taking care of themselves as well as their, their sons and brothers. Um, because uh, it, it, we're in, we're in a, a tough fight and we're in a tough fight for a, for a long time. Thank you, Linda, and that is very important advice indeed. And with that, we come to the second part of our online event here at World Duchenne Awareness Day, where we focus more on the women surrounding people with Duchenne. What does it mean to be a Duchenne mother, or a sibling, or a girlfriend, or a spouse? Coming up, I will be talking to Eugenio Mercuri about his 25 years of experience in the clinic with Duchenne families. I will talk to Daniela Kiefer, who is a psychologist, about her recommendations to support mothers and families around people with Duchenne. And I will talk to Hazel Weaver, who is a founder of the Duchenne Sibling Network. But first, I take you to Chile, where we talk to Josefina, who is the mother of Pedro, about her story, what it means to be a Duchenne mother. <laughs> El ser madre es la muestra más inmensa de generosidad del mundo. Yo creo que no existe otro amor más inmenso que uno pueda sentir por otra persona. Incondicional. No existe. Yo creo que es un amor perfecto el que uno siente hacia sus hijos. Eh, no hay interés, eh, no hay eh, nada a cambio. Él es capaz uno de sacrificarse hasta la muerte es capaz de levantarse mil veces si el niño está enfermo llorando. Eh, es posible que uno se saque su abrigo, aunque esté nevando y lo pueda tapar para que él no pase frío. Yo creo que, que es un ejemplo de lo que va quedando en el mundo como valioso en términos de relaciones, de verdad. Eh, Sé que, por supuesto, deben existir amores de madre que matan, pero lo que, lo que se siente en general, las personas que tienen un niño con Duchenne o las personas que tienen el niño sano, es de verdad la felicidad máxima. La felicidad máxima de poder querer a alguien, más que te quieran. Amar a alguien es mucho más satisfactorio a veces que te devuelvan ese amor. I am now joined by Professor Eugenio Mercuri, Professor in Pediatric Neurology at the Dumelli Hospital at the Catholic University in Rome. Welcome, Professor. Thank you. Good to see you. You are a specialist in pediatric neurology over 25 years already and also in neuromuscular disorders. And I would like to talk with you about the mothers surrounding patients with Duchenne and what you've seen and learned in those 25 years of experience. But let's start with this powerful video of Josefina. What, what do you see when you watch her? Well, the video was very powerful and uh, I was very impressed by a few words that the mother was saying. Uh, when, when we see Duchenne's mothers, uh, um, what is always uh, very typical in, in many of them uh, is uh, how dedicated they are the, with, uh, to their children, how passionate they are to this. And I was very uh, impressed by one word that the, 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 the mother said, that, you know, you sacrifice yourself. And this, of course, this is uh, something that is very good for many aspects because there is a lot of awareness, there is a lot of care of their children. They are always very careful that the needs are, of their children are very very well looked after, but it also has some negative signs because uh, um, it's, it's very good that the mothers, uh, you know, take care of their children, but they, they shouldn't forget that they should look after themselves. So this sacrifice is probably too much sometimes. They, they give up many aspects of their social life. Very often they give up their jobs or the quality of their, their quality of life in general. And sometimes they even give up their own health, uh, health just to look after their children. So uh, I'm always uh, 
um, impressed by the passion they have, uh, but uh, this is not always a good sign, and I think some, something should be done to help these mothers to go through this process, because uh, since diagnosis, even at the time when uh, soon after diagnosis the children are still doing extremely well and uh, there is no need for a lot of care, uh, the, 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 the focus of the mother is still on looking continuous on the children. They develop such a strong relationship, that some, sometimes uh, it's not completely healthy for the, for the mother. And uh, I think this, this is an aspect that should be looked uh, after more carefully. Exactly. And, and we hear Josefina say this about a general relationship between a parent and a child. Is there anything specific in, in the 25 years you worked with Duchenne parents that is specific for that category? Well, this relation is, is, is always uh, extremely strong. There is a sort of diet of the mother and the child. You see them as, uh, you know, the, the child is often looking at the mother to see what she feels and, and, and the other way around. Uh, but uh, I think uh, the, uh, as I said, this is often very positive, mm -hmm. but uh, I think we should focus a bit more on the sort of help we can give to these mothers. Being, uh, especially in the mothers who are carriers, there are some medical aspects that should be covered. They should look after the cardiac part. They should have regular monitors. But we're always a bit concerned about also other aspects of general health. We recently ran a survey. So just a quick act. You, you say this in a, in a by sentence. They should have regular cardiac checks. They should look after their own health. Is this common practice around the world? It's, it's, it's not a common practice because this is less so it's an important mother. lesson it's, it's for this. It's an important lesson. We recently ran a survey asking the mothers of uh, children with neuromuscular disorders, and many of them were Duchenne kids, uh, mothers of Duchenne kids, uh, and uh, we were appalled by, see, by seeing the results of this poll that showed that over 90% of the mothers had not performed any health check. Uh, for many, many years, uh, in some cases since the diagnosis of the child. And this is not good uh, on, uh, on, on different uh, uh, ways. Uh, first, because everyone should look after himself, but ex in, in general, right? In general, in yeah. general, but also if the mother thinks that they should look after their children, even if this is the priority, they should be in good health to be able to, to care about their children. So I think it's very important that uh, we provide some, some sort of support to these mothers. When we, when we give a diagnosis, this is, of course, uh, uh, we, we break a system. You know, we, we, you know, the, we see a, a lot of desperation. We, we see a lot of uh, anxiety coming after this diagnosis, even at the time when the children are well. And uh, we have to be able to uh, provide some, some help to this mother. Very often, we... Um, and when you we, say we in this context, you talk about we, the clinical professionals. The clinical professionals. Or the field the, the, around the, the, the field in general. We, we, are a we feel we are a community. You mm -hmm. know, we as mm -hmm. clinicians are part of a larger team with psychologists, social workers, and so on. And then, you know, we have very strong uh, links with the family association and so on. We, as a community, we should think of different ways of uh, giving support to this mother. This, uh, very often we uh, think that uh, providing some practical help uh, is the way to help this mother, which is, which is true, of course, but this is not the end of it. You know, we, we sometimes we need uh, to provide some proper psychological support so to, to help them to go through the diagnosis. Some mothers who are carriers cannot get uh, uh, over the idea that uh, the inheritance of the disease comes through through them because it's, it's, it's related it's to... It's a the, feeling of it's, guilt. It's a feeling of guilt, even if there is no reason for being guilty because they were not aware of this and they shouldn't have known. So it's a, so it's a, it's a non-necessary guilt, let's say. But it's, but it's, but there. it's still there. But it's yeah. still there. And I think we need support uh, in going through the diagnostic part uh, soon after diagnosis, but we also need some support uh, in the way of coping with everyday life because the way they are dedicated to their child some, sometimes it's a bit too much. They, they really uh, renounce to sacrifice, which is the, the word yeah. that the mothers say. They sacrifice their, their social life. They, they sacrifice... Uh, ma many mothers give up their jobs to look after their children. And, and sometimes, you know, when the children and, get and older... And you say this ec extreme caring, this, this dedication can be too much. Well, it, I'm, I'm Italian, and you know Italian mothers, so it's, it, the fact that an Italian said that uh, it's, it's, it can be too much really says a lot. But I think sometimes it's too much, you know. There must be a balance, because a person who is uh, um, happier with herself, because has a, 
has a job, has a, um, has a social life, has a, um, other aspects of her life which are not looking, just looking after the child, is also a, a person who is happier and uh, uh, this happiness, I think, will go through also in the care of the child. So I think this is an important aspect that we often forget. Yes, and an important message, I think, on this World Duchenne Awareness Day about women and Duchenne. So let's see if we can try to make that practical. What, what type of care, what type of support have you seen working in your years of experience? What's useful? Well, we, we are working on this, trying to establish what is, but I think, first of all, it's important to, uh, to provide some psychological support at the time of diagnosis. This is an important time, yeah. and, the, and the mothers, the families need, need support on, on this. The second part is uh, to provide some support on, the, on, on some aspects of care, especially with older children. The, the need for care increases with, with age, of course, and, yeah. and sometimes there is need uh, for just uh, taking off the load that the mothers carry on, on just on themselves. And the third part is uh, uh, encouraging these this women to remember that uh, they, are, they are not just mothers of Duchenne, they are people, they are, they are individual people who should look after themselves. So encourage them to have a regular check of their health. You know, the, uh, so many women don't do this. And uh, so it's, it's encouraging, making sure that when they come cl to clinic that uh, they do follow some regular checks. And some are related to the disease because carriers need to do uh, cardiac examination on a, regular, on, a, on a regular basis and so on. But some others are just related to general health. You know, this is what every single woman should do in, in real life, irrespective of they are a mother of Duchenne or not. Yeah, and I, I learned about the plan at, at your clinic where you now might have parallel paths, right? Yes, this is just a, a pilot experience because when we saw these results, we were so appalled that because we are in the department with uh, women's health and, and child health, uh, I, we, we immediately rang the, uh, our gynecologist and the sinologist and so on, and we asked for some support. So we are studying a plan that uh, will allow the mothers, when they come with their children for their children assessment, to do a parallel assessment where, where they can do re regular checks. It's still something we we are planning that we would like to implement. We would like, we would like this to be a, a pilot experience just to raise awareness of how important this is. Exactly, and that's why we also talk about it here today and, and we're looking forward to the, the, the results of this pilot. Next up, we are going to talk more about this uh, psychological aspect with a, a colleague of yours, Daniela Chievo. But before you go, is there anything else you would like to say to the mothers watching this program here today, besides the already great advice you've shared with us? No, I think the, um, it's very much what we already said, uh, is that uh, the, um, they, 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 they really should uh, uh, make sure that, uh, you know, the, the, the Josephine was talking about happiness of the children. They, 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 they should understand that the happiness of their children comes also through their own happiness. Uh, and uh, they shouldn't put themselves just uh, as a second or third line uh, to the needs of the child. I know this is difficult to accept for a mother, but they should really make an effort because if they are happier and healthier, this will have a, such a, a benefit, positive uh, impact on their child's uh, health and life. So th this is the key message. Beautiful. Thank you for underlining Thank that. You. Next up, we take you to India, where we talk to Dr. Lakshmi Raman about her work in supporting and empowering women both in rural areas and urban areas and the differences that bring specifically in India. <laughs> Dr. Lakshmi, Dr. B.R. Lakshmi, Founder, Trustee and Managing Director of MDCRC, Molecular Diagnostic Counseling Care and Research Center, which is in Coimbatore, Tamil Nadu, India. And we work in the public health domain, mainly genetics and public health. And it's more than a decade we have been working on pediatric neuromuscular disorders with focus, mainly Duchenne and SME. Dushin has been our thrust area, and we have created community genetics model to address Dushin mainly in the rural areas. Awareness is very critical for a disorder like Dushin. We all of us know it's a rare disorder, but in a country like India, 
it is more an orphan or neglected disorders and what ndcrc has been focusing is to identify to prevent it in the next generation dushim is a x link recessive disorder where generally the mother could be a carrier and when it was women and dushim i had so much to really share because for any disorder mother becomes very crucial for the kid it might be any country any land mother is a mother and when we say women it's just not the mother when you come to children with dushim and the families then we have the sisters it might be elder or younger the grandmothers the aunts the wife of a bicker patient the daughters of a bicker patient so it's such a huge community and again these are extraordinary people and to say ndcrc has made it very special with this women in india when you say it's a city or when it's urban the girls are educated mothers are educated financially they have the economics to manage and their health centers are approachable for them but when it comes to the rural they are less educated they don't even go to the college or even complete their 10th or the 12th standard as we call it in india and they get married very early like say 16 or 17 and they don't have a voice in reproduction so we felt our need is to reach these women who are in the rural who need a voice who need a hand to hold and that is where for the last one decade we have been working with the women in the rural and again as i told you very grateful to all the supporters the government and the donors for making this happen for us we train the complete health workers to pick the children with symptoms very early because a rural mother doesn't know she doesn't go to google to understand the symptoms or oh, the child is having a trip he falls down he has difficulty in climbing stairs or oh, there is a calf muscle hypertrophy but then that mother is not aware there is some issue so we sort of educate the village health workers who for example the public health system in india is wonderful so for every state there are districts and each district has a block and then for every 1000 persons we have a village health nurse so we educate the village health nurses so that for every 1000 houses we have a village health nurse so she is able to quickly identify with the training we give them they are able to identify at the grassroots level and then we do a differential diagnosis and the neurologist comes in to our camps we collect the sample bring back we do the work up then we get back with the sample with the post is pro ban and that is when we do a pre test career counseling so the community genetics working model that mdcrc has made we have just completed tamil nadu and it can be a pan india project as such and here we understood women in the rural as i told you who need a voice who need a hand holding so we are with them from the pre test career counseling we tell the importance of career counseling because oh you are a career no, there is no issue He'll handhold you. We have empowered the women in the rural to make her choice in the reproduction. We have given them the muscle or the strength to do it. Coming to the next aspect, these women, even if whatever qualification or education they have, it is so difficult to leave a Dushin kid at home and go for work. So she becomes very financially dependent on the. male in the house or who is working so we thought we need to empower them financially i would say yes india is developing and our women are special and as mdcrc we are doing all out to empower our women again women in the families who have dushi Thank you Dr. Lakshmi Raman for sharing your story with us and your amazing work that you're doing in India and throughout this World Dushan Awareness Day sharing with a global audience as well. We now zoom deeper into the psychological support specifically for the mothers that Eugenio just also mentioned and we're joined by one of his colleagues 
um, uh, Daniela Chiefo, you're a professor in general psychology at the Catholic University in Rome, but you're also a psychologist and psychotherapist in the Gemelli Hospital, where you've worked with hundreds of family who are uh, uh, with, with Duchenne as well. And also back in our studio, Elizabeth Vroom, you are the chair of the World Duchenne Organization, but more importantly in this conversation, also the mother of Justice, who just turned 32, who is a, a boy with uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Welcome, Elizabeth, as well. Daniela, in your work in the hospital, what do you see as the most important challenges for the mothers living with a child with Duchenne? When uh, our mother receives a neuromuscular disorder, a di diagnosis of neuromuscular disorder, uh, nothing is the same uh, because uh, she has to deal with the emotional burden. Uh, there, uh, this requires listening uh, to elaborate uh, the new form of life. Exactly. So you see, it's, it's a life-changing event. Elizabeth, do you still remember that conversation when you heard for the, the diagnosis for the first time? Yes, I know, I know. But also now comes in mind when you say this beautiful story that it says, like, ha getting this diagnosis of Duchenne is like you're booking a holiday to Italy, and then the captain says, and now we're landing in the Netherlands, and you feel this is not what we prepared for. This is not the, the travel guide we have. This is not what we, we wanted. But then, once you are in the Netherlands, you can still have a good time. So that's a story which was told uh, over and over, and I think that's true, that you, you have different expectations, uh, as uh, Daniela said, but also you, you think like, how can I be the best mother, you know? So, and you, for example, I remember that I thought like, now my child has this diagnosis, I can't laugh anymore and have fun. But then only like two hours later think like, but if I'm a depressed mom, he's double handicapped, you know? He has and this disease and a depressed mother. And I thought, if he would never have a friend, then yeah. I will be his best friend. Of course I'm not his best friend, I'm his mother, you know? So there are a lot of these things, but above all, what, you know what I remember most? That I thought, yeah. we have time, we have time. Uh, like they will live another 20 years, what was at that moment. I lost a daughter after five days, so we didn't have time. Mm -hmm. But knowing that in this disease we had time, 20 years maybe at that moment we thought, that, made, that, 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 that gave a certain strength that we can do something. It's not yet there, you know, we can still do, do something. So that is what I remember, but it's 30 years ago now. So. Wow, long time. Daniela, obviously here we see a, a mother who is very strong and is, seems to be coping very well. Yes. What, what advice do you have once mothers or, or families watching are confronted with, with these emotions? It is essential for every mother to regain a position of her own time. In this process, uh, group and uh, relationship are extremely needed. Exactly. Elizabeth, it's a key message I learned to find your own time as a mother, yeah. to carve out your own time. How was that for you? Well, in a sense, I was lucky having a, a nice profession and having an own uh, practice as an orthodontist. So it was natural that I kept working. And, and then years later, my son told me he was always happy that I did that. So it, it is not, you don't have to feel guilty. I, I did it and of course, I was there also when there were things in school, but I, I think having my own life, my own profession was really important yeah. for both of us, not only for me, but also for him. Daniela, thank you so much for sharing your time with us today and your important work. Please uh, push that forward. Elizabeth, thank you as well. I'll see you later in this program back in the chair as well. Now we take you to Lebanon, because it was already mentioned here, support networks, Elizabeth said, are very important. And we'll focus on a few in the uh, segments coming up. In Lebanon, we, we caught up with Aida Adra, who set up the uh, support network in the Middle East and shares her experience with us today. I'm Aida Adra. I'm, uh, I'm the mother of Wafi, uh, who has Duchenne muscular dystrophy. After the diagnosis of Wafi, it was like a um, uh, very hard time 
passing through for me, for my family, me and my husband, for sure. After a certain time, we decided to accept, to uh, to change our attitude and uh, and uh, accepting the reality of the diagnosis and to establishing land, the Lebanese Association uh, of Neuromuscular Disease. The first connection uh, with land are the mother. It depends about the family. Sometimes the mothers are the strongest to face, sometimes the man, but in most cases, the women or the mothers are the first ones to make this contact and uh, to starting accepting this reality and uh, and to start this fight. So the mothers usually who, who make the first step to um, uh, toward land and uh, seeking uh, uh, this kind of support. After this uh, uh, first contact, for sure, uh, we have like a, a long conversation and we start uh, uh, diagnosis what kind of support we can uh, do, uh, how we can direct them toward uh, uh, better uh, care, better quality of life, um, how we can uh, support them uh, directly and indirectly. The most amazing about uh, the situation that uh, by the time um, we become like, um, like a family. Um, we can have like a direct contact and sometimes like uh, if you have uh, some questions uh, that we uh, we would like to have uh, many answers about it so uh, there is uh, the groups where we can uh, ask these questions and we can have like many respond about the situation we support many kind of neuromuscular like uh, SMA like uh, and others so um, you know uh, when uh, these kinds of uh, disease progress so, so uh, we share we have the same needs we share like uh, uh, the same uh, uh, sweepy or daily life so we are here to help uh, each other It's always the power of love, the power of uh, support who will uh, help us to deal with our daily life and uh, by the time we become stronger and uh, uh, and uh, we are here the mother to support the whole family. Thank you, Aida, of sharing your lessons and the importance of the power of a group. We are still on the theme of women around Duchenne and we move from the mothers towards siblings and spouses. Next up, I will talk to Hazel Weaver, founder of the Duchenne Sibling Network and again with Nicoletta Madia about her work for the Social Descent Project. But first, I'm going to take you into Australia where we caught up with Doug and Lauren Robbins, where Lauren shares with us what it's like to be the spouse of Doug, who is suffering from Duchenne muscular dystrophy. I'm Lauren, I'm 38. I live in Cairns in Australia. Hello, I'm Doug. Her husband, I uh, live in Cairns as well. We met online. It, it took a lot of emails to um, to finally find Lauren. He was very open and passionate about his um, performances and arts and really paid attention to what I was saying and did a little bit of research of his own and came back with some beautiful responses. And I just, just fell in love and I was a little bit shocked when I met him um, and I sort of said to one of my friends, oh, I don't know, what, what should I do? Like, you know, <laughs> I had visions of taking him sailing and it was clearly not going to happen. Um, and she just said, well, you're not going to marry the guy, just go on a date. And he was so loving and <laughs> caring and funny. He was hilarious. Um, we had such a good time that I, yeah, we just kept dating and then we moved in together and got married. <laughs> I was afraid of breaking his heart if I couldn't cope with the um, caring aspect of it. I realised that you would have to pay, play a big part um, in with the cares and um, 
I, I guess just helping him. Like I, I was a bit scared of whether or not I could physically and emotionally do it. And then, um, but it's, it's, there's times, there's times where I, I don't cope very well, but um, it's, it's not, it's because the situation's not who Doug is as a person. And I think that's what helps pull you through is that, you know, Doug is just amazing, <laughs> loving, <laughs> fantastic husband. She's um, uh, very kind and generous, live as independently as we can. It was a beautiful, really, really beautiful day. Um, Doug <laughs> had too much of a good time at the Bucks party. Oh no, he, he had an episode at the Bucks party where his, um, nobody realised he was losing his breath. So he was in hospital until 10 a.m. the morning of the wedding. Um, the wedding started at 2 p.m. So I was a very stressed out bride trying to organise two weddings, one at the hospital, one where we wanted to have it, um, just in case he got out. Um, but all the nurses worked very, very hard and he got out at 10 a.m. and was waiting at the end of the aisle. Um, it was a wonderful day surrounded by family and friends and everybody helped out setting up and it was just a magical day. It's, it's not just a young, um, uh, a picky relationship, but it's actually, um, you know, we, we stay together and support each other. Well, mutual respect and complete love. I feel like we're just like every other, any other couple. It's just, you know, um, we have different different challenges. Um, I feel like other people have challenges in, um, you know, how to raise a family and, and differing of opinions or, fam, you know, um, work-life balance, all that. We, we have the same challenges. It's just, we also have work-life caring balance because we're together, we can work towards any problem. Thank you, Doug and Lauren, and, and the courage of being so open and sharing your story with us. And what I really love, the moment where Doug says, we are not in a pity relationship, but we are almost like a normal couple. Well, if that even exists, Doug and Lauren, I can tell you from lived experience. Um, we are still on the theme, women around Duchenne, and we move deeper into the topic of of girlfriends, but more specifically siblings that we're uh, talking earlier about. And I'm now joined by Hazel Weaver. Hazel, welcome. Hi. You are one of the co-founders of the uh, Duchenne Sibling Network, and you are the sister you grew up with your brother, Darren, who is living with Duchenne. And also back here, Nicoletta Madia, you are the community coordinator for World Duchenne Organization, but also running the Social Duchenne Project, where you create stories like these beautiful videos. You, you actually produced this one, it's beautiful, congratulations. Yeah, thank you so much. Hey, so I'd like to start with you. Can, you. can you describe to us what it was like to be the sister of Darren when you grew up? Um, being the sister of Darren was really fun. That's, that's the thing that I like to share first, is Darren was such a cool person to be around. He was funny, he was naughty, he was kind as well. But he also had this condition, Duchenne, which um, does allow you to live, I guess, a unique life because you're growing up alongside this condition. Um, and that can be challenging and it can be difficult but it can also be incredibly rewarding because it allows you as a sibling to have a perspective on life that I don't think many people get to experience and that's something that I've taken from that especially as I've grown up and started my own family um, yeah so I think yeah. that's can you, can you colour in a little bit of those challenges? What makes it so challenging to be a sibling of a person so like Duchenne? So, one of the challenges that I think a lot of siblings feel is a very complex set of emotions that can happen all at the same time from quite a young age. And because it's happening from a young age, it can be really hard for you to 
navigate those emotions, understand what you're feeling and be able to express what you're feeling. So a lot of siblings and myself included have to find ways of managing that. One of the ways I did it was I internalized everything and suppressed a lot of feeling, um, partly because I didn't want to make anything more difficult than it already was. For the family? For everyone, yeah. Everybody involved. Yeah, yeah. you can see, you can see your, your brother is obviously going and managing this condition really well because he's just living his life, but you can see at times it's quite hard. You can see your parents are doing everything they can to support him and you. So you do nothing, mm. or I did nothing. I did as little as possible to make as, as, as little fuss as possible. And that is not a healthy thing to do. Um, and it definitely caught up with me eventually, which is why I guess I started looking at what was out there to support siblings. To support, yeah, let's get yeah. to that in a minute. I, I hear you say this balance. Mm -hmm. you know, on the one hand, now that you're an adult, very rewarding, but I can imagine as a, as a child growing up, also very challenging. I mean, it was rewarding as a child too. Okay. Because, so it's not all bad. Mm. It's difficult. I don't want to take anything away from that. It's very, very hard at times. But it can be rewarding as well. Um, when you see your brother getting better from a really bad spout of illness, when you see him getting treated to certain things or allow he gets to have unique experiences that's really nice it and it was nice to see him um get attention because he deserved it you know yeah. he yeah, was yeah. an entertaining kid and and he deserved that attention so that was nice as well nice nicoletta you you interviewed more than 200 families already what do you hear when hazel talks do you recognize what she says from your other encounters absolutely this is something that I really recognize from uh, other siblings, for sure, but also from mothers, sisters, other sisters, or even, you know, people affected by uh, Duchenne or other neuromuscular diseases. Because when we listen to their stories, we have emotions coming out, but we also have challenges coming out. And uh, this is extremely helpful. This is the power of storytelling. Yeah, beautiful work. Hazel, you already referred to it at some point, sharing stories and exploring. Together with Peter Duffy, you decided to found the uh, Duchenne Sibling Network. Why did you feel that was needed? What was igniting that? Um. Well, there was actually four of us that founded it. Um, and it started because we all met at a charity conference and they had, within their program, they had a section where they wanted siblings to share their experiences of being mm. a sibling. And we all met. And I'd never met anyone who'd even heard of Duchenne before I attended that conference in 2018. So I was 30 years old at this point, and I met these people who immediately got it. I've never had that happen in my life, and it was amazing. The conference went really well. Um, we had some really, really lovely positive feedback from us sharing our stories. And we came away from it, and we said, what can we do to replicate this? Because mm -hmm. this has been something that none of us have experienced before. And so we came up with the Duchenne Sibling Network purely to provide a space where siblings can share their stories if they want to, or just be part of a group of people where some people will share their stories and they're able to listen to them. They in can just lurk and, and listen. But listen to them in confidence. Exactly. exactly. So they don't have to spill out everything if they don't want to, because not everyone wants to do that. They can, they can just sit and listen and know that there's someone there that totally gets it. Wow. Because it, it genuinely changed my life meeting those four people the four of us, it, it changed my life in a really positive way. Because I was not, I, I, when I was going through everything I was going through, I, I was suffering with really bad depression at the time. 
and I was seeking support and I was on medication, nothing worked. Mm. Nothing was working and it really angered me because I couldn't understand why I was doing everything you're supposed to do and it wasn't working. Yeah. Um, so I did something I'd never done before and I wrote down the feelings I felt as a sibling and I allowed the charity to share that and that was led to, to this. this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the things that the Shen Sibling Network does is an online video series of sibling in the spotlight. Uh, it's, it's a bit of an ad hoc organic thing, but you've done several already. If you reflect on those stories, your own story, but also the stories from the others, what, what are some of the key learnings that you think that, that others watching this can take away from that? I think it's that you, you will notice that everyone we speak to are all very different people. They are different ages, they are living very different lives, they have different careers, they have families, but they're all living their own lives. And I think it's that you have this experience and you're going to manage it in whatever way you feel is best for you. There's mm. no right or wrong way mm. to do that. But the one thing we have seen is when you get two siblings together, there's a connection there that both of them will feel. And you won't necessarily be able to explain that feeling, but it's a wonderful connection. And, and that's why we do the spotlights. And that's why we try to talk to a variety of people um, who are willing to share their stories, because it shows that if you're a sibling, you're not, you're not set to live one particular life. You can do so many different things with your life successfully. And provide inspiration for that, yeah. Yeah, it, it's just almost like holding out a hand and saying, look, we're here, it's all good. And look, look, these are siblings too. I can imagine if I would be a family member of a person with Duchenne, I would now think, where is this sibling network? Is this open to people around the world? How can they, how can they find this? Yeah, so we have, we're on most social media platforms. Um, we have a Facebook page, which everyone's open to, to like and share, and all of our spotlights are available on that. We have a closed... Um, sibling group on Facebook which is available to siblings over the age of 16 so they're more than welcome to join that and we're on Twitter and Instagram as well. Exactly so please search for the Duchenne Sibling Network and you, you'll find it and it's good to know that the, the Facebook group is also closed eh? so there's a safer environment to share. And only siblings are in that group as well. Exactly yeah. Nicoletta you are also in a unique position doing all the interviews visualizing the daily life of living with Duchenne if you look back at those 200 plus videos, what are some of the learnings that you take away from that? For sure, uh, I would say empathy, because looking at someone else's story can, you know, turn stronger your empathy, your capacity to feel someone else's life, and also have the opportunity to look at your life and keep with you some learnings. Another important point is that uh, while sharing, you know, your story, you create a connection, as uh, Hazel said, with someone else. So this helped many mothers, many uh, young people to create networks, as we have seen. And networks uh, have a really huge power to, to change the world. And uh, finally, the other really important point is empowerment. Because when you really realize what you are living, what you can do, and how support and education are important for your life, you are empowered and you can really change uh, what is needed and you can really make a difference. So I would say these three keywords are really part of the stories that we listen every day with our job, that I have also the opportunity to listen, to listen working at the hospital with specific paths dedicated to, the, to women. So this is really, really important to create this connection between the human being in general. Well, thank you both for your amazing work. And you can sense how this online event is slowly transitioning into action. And it's a perfect transition into our third and last theme of our uh, online event today, which is all about inspiring women in and around the Duchenne community. Well, to be honest, we have been uh, inviting inspiring women and listening to inspiring women throughout the show. 
but we'll kick that part off by taking you to Mexico, to Graciela Mendez, who is a very passionate aunt of a boy living with Duchenne, and shares with us her efforts to set up a support network in Latin America. <laughs> Mi nombre es Graciela Méndez, eh, soy fundadora de una asociación en México que se llama Enlace Distrofia Muscular Duchenne Becker y llevamos 20 años trabajando para niños y jóvenes que padecen esta enfermedad. Estamos en la ciudad de Chihuahua, México y ahorita mi rol dentro de la organización es como directora estratégica en diferentes proyectos que, que tenemos a nivel pues, mundial. Yo llegué al, al, a la comunidad Duchen eh, por mi sobrino. Tengo un sobrino, Lalo, que ahorita ya tiene 26 años y pues hace más de 20 años que, que supimos del, del diagnóstico. Lalo es mi ahijado, aparte de ser mi sobrino, es el primero de los nietos de, de la familia y pues es como mi hijo propio, ¿verdad? Yo no tengo otros tres hijos, pero digamos que Lalo es el mayor. Y para mí era muy importante el, el poder apoyar a mi hermana, eh, ya que pues era muy difícil, era muy difícil conseguir todo, no... no ninguno de los doctores sabía nada y pues a mí siempre me ha llamado mucho la atención la, la parte social, el poder ayudar a las personas y en aquel entonces pues yo tenía la oportunidad de que mi esposo trabajaba, entonces yo me pude dedicar al, al 100% como voluntaria en la creación de la asociación, en empezar con los proyectos y fueron Empezamos en el, en el 2000 ya formalmente la, la organización y durante esos primeros cinco años pues yo le dediqué haciendo de todo, ¿verdad? Eh, éramos varios voluntarios, los papás sobre todo de los niños que en aquel entonces iniciaban con nosotros y, y fue como empe empezamos, la verdad es que eh, he estado, somos una familia muy unida y como familia hemos este, trabajado todos en la organización. Enlace de Distrofia Muscular Duchenne Becker eh, es una organización civil eh, no lucrativa y los servicios que otorgamos lo queremos hacer de una manera integral. Siempre hemos tratado de que abarque absolutamente todo. En México es muy difícil eh, obtener un, un tratamiento médico completo, de hecho no existe para los niños con Duchenne y eh, eso fue lo primero que quisimos este, ofrecerles a, lo, a los papás que, que se fueron uniendo a la organización porque pues si no manteníamos bien a los niños médicamente pues todo lo demás no, no iba a poder suceder. Entonces, eh, les otorgamos los que son eh, consultas médicas con, con varios especialistas. Para nosotros también era una parte muy importante que los niños pudieran empezar a independizarse, a, a, a poder pues, tener más ilusiones. Entonces, les hemos otorgado sillas de ruedas eléctricas. Hemos logrado tener respiradores y, este, y ventiladores. Eh, para nosotros también es muy importante las terapias, entonces les otorgamos terapias físicas, terapia respiratoria, tenemos unos Copacist que, que nos ayudan en la terapia respiratoria y eh, también les otorgamos, que es bien importante para nosotros también la terapia psicológica y tanatológica para, para tener ese círculo. Eh, es muy importante para nosotros la parte de inclusión social. Entonces tratamos de hacer reuniones con los jóvenes, reuniones con los niños, eventos con los papás. 
qué más quisiera que, que nuestros niños estuvieran como en otras partes del mundo, que pueden ir a la universidad acompañados y vivir solos, eso ahorita en México pues no se puede, ¿verdad? Entonces, eh, como que es mi ilusión que, que todos nuestros niños y jóvenes sean independientes, que tengan un motivo para vivir, que, que puedan salir adelante y que logren sus sueños, eso es, eso es lo principal. Thank you, Graciela. And you can see how this online event is emerging from educational and discovering to more activism and inspiring to really start to work and do something together. And in this third and last part, we talk with two amazing, inspiring women in the global community around Duchenne. Pat Furlong, welcome from the United States. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. You are the founding president of the Parent Project for Muscular Dystrophy, from one of the initial patient advocacy uh, communities around Duchenne. And next to you is another powerhouse, Elizabeth Frohm, back here again, founder of the Dutch uh, Duchenne Parent Project. And also together you found this World Duchenne organization as well with others. So let's zoom in on, on what we can learn from all your experience as well. But before we do that, Pat, you also sit here as, as a mother of two boys uh, living with Duchenne. What, what is that experience has been like for you? So my experience was long ago, at a time when there really was so much or so little known about Duchenne. The gene was thought to be around. There were lots of teams that were going for understanding and cloning that gene, but it hadn't been cloned. So when my sons were diagnosed, they were diagnosed by a muscle biopsy that looked abnormal, and that's all they could say. And then they were diagnosed with Duchenne. So there was no care, no treatment, really no genetic understanding. It, it was really a very dark time. Mm. And at some point, 30 years ago, you said, we need to come together and we need to advocate and, and raise awareness about what's going on here. Can you take us back to that moment? What ignited this? Sure. I, I think that the, every parent can remember the day that this, this word happened and this word echoed from every wall and every, every place they went and they carried it. So I was in a room with a physician, and my son had in injured his ankle that night before attempting to ride a big wheel. I carried him home that night and took him to an orthopedic surgeon friend of ours who said Duchenne, out in his waiting room. And just sort of as a textbook definition, he looked at his toes and described loss of, wa loss of ambulation, loss of moving your arms, and, the, and he described this disease as fatal. And I remember hearing that echoing and echoing. And, and interestingly enough, because I live in a small community, by the time I got home, my neighborhood was aware that Duchenne had entered our lives. So the Furlong family was desperate and alone. And I was going to be and defined as that crazy Mrs. Furlong who's going to do crazy things. And I became accustomed to that idea because at a moment you're grieving and the world has collapsed around you, but then that grief turns into resilience and you decide that, by God, I'm going to do something. I didn't know what something was, but I decided to do something. Yeah, we've, we've already heard in the show the word warrior. We see the immense passion as well. Can you share with us some of the challenges you had to overcome once you try to channel all this energy? Sure. So I'm, I've been in the nursing profession for a very long time, and I was in, very, um, I was in the intensive care unit and, and renal dialysis and a whole organ transplantation, so I felt empowered in medicine. And then this, this medicine could not help my sons. So I think at that point then, as you decide what you can do, the, the activities that I did was running around the country pretending I was a postdoc looking for a job because I wanted to understand what's happening here, where's the money, who's doing this? And so that sort of position of pretending I was someone else got me that title of not a medical professional, but a crazy person. And, and then physicians, because medicine has been very paternalistic for a very long time, still is in many countries, physicians looked at parents or patients as unable to understand medicine because mm. it was so complicated. We're right? the doctors. Oh, right? yeah. We're the doctors. So we know yeah. everything that's yeah. right. But actually, the patient knows more about their disease than they will ever know because we 
live with it 24 seven. So we're watching those boys. So I remember a physician said to me, you know, you can come back in six months, I'll tell you how he's doing. I said, you can call me any minute of the day and I'll tell you how they're doing. So I think it's, it's that. So you go from this crazy, this medical professional to a crazy person. And, and it was hard because I live in a country that is very large and, and there were organizations that were suggesting that they were going to treat or cure this disease. But it had been, by the time I heard the word Duchenne, 50 years and I didn't see progress. And I also didn't see progress in care. How do you care for these children? What is the best way to care for them, to preserve what they have? And where's the research? What's going on? So we had major challenges there, in addition to the fact that we were suggested to be competing. But at the end of the day, this is a village, right? Mm -hmm. We're all in it, doing whatever we can to move this needle. So we face lots of challenges, in addition to the fact that, I understand, it takes a billion dollars to, to create a therapy. And we started off with, maybe 100,000. So 100,000 and a billion is a little bit of distance in between. So you, we had to think about how do you, how do you grow that yeah. pot of money, but also how do you leverage? How do you use other institutions, other ways, other academic institutions, other federal institutions to get more money going forward? So we face considerable challenges. But this is really the foundation of the parent and patient advocacy in the field of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Elizabeth, when you listen to Pat talk, what, what, what are you thinking? Well, I, I was thinking about um, how we met and it was by fax, <laughs> because by that time there was not email internet. So then, Pat, one day I came in my room as office and there was so many faxes that I could hardly enter the room because there was this big, really bulk of fax messages on a roll coming in. And then we went to the meeting and I hear you now saying like, first of all, I have to say, Pat is and has been the inspiration to all of us. We can't say it enough. This is the moment to say it again. But um, I learned about a meeting Pat was organizing in Orlando, 94. And I heard it from friends. I think it was three days before the meeting. We got in touch, so we went there and then Pat was asking the scientists who were there, who were so generous to come, like, why don't we have a cure? Why is nobody working at a cure? And they said, money. So Pat said, how much do we need? And they said, 40 million before the year 2000. Do you remember? I and, do remember. And I thought like, okay, I'm Dutch, US 20 times more, two million is for me. So I went home and started Parent Project Netherlands. Really, right the next day we went, to set up this foundation. And then together we went here to Italy, to Filippo Buccella, like missionaries, you know, like almost with a suitcase. Can you do the same in Italy? Because he was online, so we could reach him by, uh, by email. So uh, this whole thing, Pat started, really helped us all. And, and uh, yeah, well, I, I mentioned before that I thought when my son was diagnosed, we have 20 years, but with that also comes, we have to use these 20 years, Excellent. you know? It's not, I'm not going to sit on the sofa and wait. So uh, listening then to somebody like Pat, who was longer on the way already by that time, your sons were when we met, I think 14, right? Yeah, 15, right. something yeah. like that, uh, was super uh, inspiring. And I think it helped us all a lot and still does. And still yeah. does, yes. And it's amazing to have you both here sitting next to each other and, and hear this story, how it all came about. Now we see several videos from people around the world also setting up support networks. Let's see if we can take some learning from you. You already shared some of the main challenges. If you both, if you could go back to yourself 20, 30 years ago, what is some important advice you would have given those, well, quoting your words, crazy woman to, to achieve where we are now and actually move further from here? I think it's to find your us. Who's your us? Your us. Who, yeah, your us, your support network. Who are the people around you that have the same story, share the same ambitions, wish for the same outcomes, who are willing to be collaborative, because it doesn't help for you know lots of different disparate activities. It helps that we're all doing activities, whatever they are, but going in the same direction. So I think I would tell myself that, because as a parent, you just, you, you start to think about, I just want my, you know, I'm gonna cure my son, and then I'm gonna take care of the rest of them. Yeah, you're hyper-focused. You're <laughs> hyper-focused on these children, and, and you're grieving at the same time. And I think if you could step back and recognize we don't typically find cures for one person. 
I mean, maybe in the future that will happen, but right now we have to really understand this disease, understand its variability, and we have to all be rowing in that same direction with different activities. I think I would tell myself that there are more of you, find them, understand them, and work with them. Beautiful message, and I, I hope everyone is picking that up and thinking, ah, great, find our us, Elizabeth. What would be your advice to that very similar passionate Elizabeth 20, 30 years ago? Well, I, I would say the same. You know, we find, I already said, finding Pat is, was part of finding us, and yeah. there we found other people, and we would go here. But also, like, the clinicians we found, we, I have to say again, the Duchenne community is really blessed with having clinicians who are super dedicated, scientists who are super dedicated. So that, that is important. But I, I think one more thing, uh, what we have learned, and I guess Pat agrees, is that we were so focused on the cure that only after a while when we saw that care was in fact the best we had, there mm. came more, uh, and, uh, more uh, let's say, attention to care. And quite often when we now see, we get in, messages from parents around the globe saying, oh, my son is just diagnosed with Duchenne, where's the cure? And then we send them the standards of care and they say, no, 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 not the standards of care, we want the cure. So I think that is also something we have to keep working on to say care at the moment, good care is the best we have. And really uh, that is what parents should do, you know, at least make sure that your child get, gets the best yeah. care. So and also organizations the, in the country. Exactly, course, join the community, become part of us, don't forget to focus on care. As well, yeah. But what do you see? Because you're still here, you're still active. What are the next steps in both the patient advocacy but also the community here together today? Boy, I think the next steps are exactly what Elizabeth has been talking about. How can we really look at gaps in care and make sure that our care is better and improves all the time, but also to enlarge our stakeholder group so that children living in countries that aren't able to access good care have access we are a global community, we're a global village, and all of us include stakeholders such as parents, brothers, sisters, un aunts, uncles, but scientists, physicians, clinicians, clinical trialists, teams of people to include federal authorities, the governments. We really want to think through how do we make the best life possible today with what we've got while we're urging for a better tomorrow. Yes, and, and I think this, this online event is, is proof of that. Basically, all the target groups you just mentioned, I'm like, oh, we've seen those around. What, is, what, what, is the, what, what can we do to further bring them in? What if, what if we encounter some resistance, like, oh, it's not important now, or it's just a rare disease, we don't have time or budget or energy for that? Well, I think there's always a way forward, right? You're going to come in life, lots of boulders in your way. You either walk over them or around them or throw and you lift them up and move them. Yeah. So, so as a community, I think we have a responsibility for each other to look at those challenges and, and see how best to overcome them. Sometimes it's government, sometimes it's clinicians, sometimes it's reaching out, sometimes it's just a hand for support. And it's all of those things that these families need and all of those things that I think we can deliver. Beautiful. Well, it's, it's amazing to, to have you here and, and all the work you have done and the foundational things you've done. Elizabeth, any, I'm, I'm obviously I'm looking for those golden actionable advices <laughs> that, that, that we can take this community further forward. Yeah, first of all, I think what our goal is to overcome hurdles, bottlenecks. That's what we yeah, do. That's, that's, we that's why we are together. That's what we do. But sometimes it also helps really to understand the other side of the table, the, the, the one who or the ones who are bothering you and not where you don't get it. Why aren't they not doing what we want? And sometimes these reasons can be overcome if you only understand why, why, why they uh, have to. So that, that would be an answer to that. And I think if we say, what are the next steps? The next step after this meeting, I think would be really to uh, make more uh, space I would say, for the women in our activities. So um, that is one of the things we should do. And of course, drug development is always there because we, <laughs> at the end, we, we the, the, the commercial of this year or the spot of this year said no cure yet. And we're all still praying and hoping for that cure to come. But till we are there, we have to do our very best and provide good care to children and adults and women around the globe. Exactly. Yeah. Pat, final reflection from you. You've been part of this program for the last two hours. Uh, the specific theme of women and Duchenne. 
What is your reflection? I think women have really been so moving um, in terms of Duchenne. I think they've been so powerful in terms of Duchenne because women are caregivers. They're also scientists, they're physicians, they're government authorities. So I think the, powerful, the power of women and the power of their us, whoever is around them, is what moves mountains. And we always talk about that. But I think fundamentally the power of women here is to take care of themselves so that they can take care of all of the things they want to accomplish in this life. So I'm so proud of World Duchenne Organization and this day of September that women are really celebrated because of what they've brought to this table and what they can do with this table. So we are moving forward. We'll always have drug development and we'll have tomorrow. And that's why women are here because they've brought tomorrow. Wow. Thank you, you both for your time and your inspiration. Stay tuned because in a moment we're going to wrap up and reflect and underline some of the most important things we would like to do uh, as well. But before that, we took you on a journey around the globe. But if you have been keeping count, we haven't touched one continent yet. So in this last video, we take you into Africa, where we met up with Scholar Mutamia, who is setting up a support network in Africa. Let's learn from her. <laughs> My name is Kola Motamia. Uh, I live in Nairobi, Kenya. I'm a mom of a 15-year-old boy with a Duchenne muscular dystrophy. He's called Ferdinand Muchogi Jugona. You see, when my, my son was diagnosed, I didn't know where to go because like the doctors will tell you things in black and white. I also went to Google, it gave me information in black and white. It made my situation even worse. After reading details on Google, the doctors, the doctors are telling you this stuff, and I was like, no, what to do? And I thought, in our countries, the, the setup in our country, we don't have that uh, platforms, like advoc advocacy groups for rare diseases where you can go join and you know, you move on. I thought it was uh, an opportunity for me on behalf of the greater community to start a foundation because I didn't have a place to fall back to. I didn't have a shoulder to cry to. So I thought, why can't, can't I do this for the community? At least any new diagnosis for kids with the DMD can have a place to get information. Parents can have a place to, you know, to release the emotions. They can have a person to talk to, and it's, it's working out. Most of the families are in Nairobi, and uh, quite a number outside Nairobi. Yeah, so we do home visits, we reach out to parents, we take counseling services to the parents and boys. We do, you know, home visits, just to encourage mom, especially mothers, because you'll find in some cases, um, like fathers, husbands have abandoned their mothers with their kids, and it's, it's not been easy for the mothers, so we take counseling services to them. But the moment we have the social interactive activities, we have smiling mothers, we have smiling moms. They keep on asking me, school, it's like you don't have a child with DMD because you seem so vibrant, you seem happy. But I tell them, you know, as time goes by, you interact with people, you interact in social activities, it builds you up. And a lot of things, you know, you know how to manage them. I mean, through these trainings, through these uh, collaborations, I believe for a better future for our community. Thank you, Scholar from Kenya. It's amazing work you do there to find the us and create a community. Now, talking about creating a community, in the last two hours we tried to inspire you and educate you about this topic of women and Duchenne. And here we are in the Palazzo in Rome, finalizing and wrapping up with the team who also kicked off. Nicoletta, how are you feeling at this moment? I'm super happy about this opportunity because it's been amazing to listen to these powerful stories, experiences of our female community, represented by many people. Thank you for all the work, Elizabeth. Proud? Yes, of course. 
of exactly. ev everyone and also that how we are together and the team together here, yes. Exactly. Sure. Now, you, throughout the program, we've seen you many times already taking notes of all the things we can and should do. If this is the final opportunity, if there's one thing that people change after this show, what do you hope they do? Well, I think what we can start doing today, I love action today already, is go back to your website, to your leaflets, to whatever information you're giving, whether you're a scientist, a patient organization, a clinician, or industry, and change your language. Make it not only Duchenne, but primarily, uh, not only boys, boys and men, but primarily uh, boys and men. I think if we can start doing that from today, that's a first step to show also we take this message seriously and we will really move forward on that. Beautiful and very hands-on. Change language because language matters and then also share your actions on social media, for example. If you do that today on World Duchenne Awareness Day, please use the hashtag WDAD2022. But if you do this throughout the month, throughout the year, or whenever you catch this video, use hashtag Women and Duchenne because you never know who might see it and who you might inspire. And with that, we come to the end of this program. It's time to express some thank yous. First of all, thank you to you for watching this program all the way to the end. Be aware that the recording is available. You can share for anyone who might find this interesting as well. And also the separate segments of this show will be available that you can then send them forward and target to directly to people who might find that of a specific interest. And then thank you to both of you, Nicoletta and Elizabeth. It's been a great pleasure to work with you on this project. And thank you to everyone involved behind the scenes as well as at World Duchenne Organization for bringing this day together. Thank you for everyone involved in raising awareness today and also a big thank you for the team here behind the scenes at the Palazzo in Rome. I hope you enjoyed the show and I look forward to see you back again in the future.